Yep, ready to go. Thank you, Rhonda. All right, thanks everyone. So, just to start off with, it's traditional that in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, spiritual connection to country, and in continuing ACU's commitment to reconciliation, it is customary to acknowledge country as we pass through. Today, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We acknowledge and celebrate the continuation of a living culture that has a unique in, in this region and in all regions uh, where people are coming in from today. We also acknowledge elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. So I'd just like to hand over to Professor Herb Marsh to introduce today's Brown Bag session. Thank you. Wonderful to have you all here. Uh, I'm not going to give you any kind of background on Rick because almost all of you know know him personally, and all of you certainly at least know of him. And I'm looking at the list of people that are visiting uh, us uh, from China and all over the world. It's wonderful to see the drawing power that Rich has. So I welcome Rich to give his overview. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and there I'm just looking at the index for your power. Well, thanks, Herb, for that long introduction. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do appreciate that. And just one of the things about the acknowledgement of uh, country, ever since I came to Australia, I've been doing that now in the United States. And the land that I come from is the Seneca, and the Seneca occupied all that area that was there, and they still are uh, living in that area. So it's, it's a really nice tradition to honor the people who served that land. Um, I'm going to talk today about uh, meta-analyses in SDT, really the meta-analyses being big overviews of the work that we do, but uh, this thing work? Yeah. Uh, I uh, but before I do, I just want to thank some people who've been instrumental in a lot of that work. And yeah. This is the first one, just, uh, just a list of recent collaborators. Uh, and one of the things I noted here is how many of my recent collaborators come from uh, from IPPE, it just says something about why I'm so happy to be back and happy to be connecting with people. So many good collaborations here. And then particularly uh, our mini team here at IPPE, this is our research group uh, in motivation and SDT that's here. And uh, of course, you was, uh, some of these people are here in the room today. Stefano uh, is not, and I guess Ben is not. But could not function without this team. It's a wonderful team to work on. We meet at odd hours uh, because of our time panel differences, uh, but always rich and inspiring meetings. So as I thought about this talk today, I thought, well, I know what most of you are probably thinking is I'm going to talk about SDT, and you're probably thinking, oh, not again. There <laughs> 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 been a lot of talks here on SDT, and I think one of the things I really hate to do uh, is give public speeches, first of all, because <laughs> I'm glossophobic, but um, Besides being a claustrophobic, I hate to repeat myself, so I'm going to try to not to repeat myself much, but introducing our work on meta-analysis.
There we uh, go. When we were studying the conditions that lead to both intrinsic motivation and to high quality internalization, those things turned out to be supports for autonomy, supports for competence, and supports for relatedness. And we saw how important those were as essentials to people's wellness. That led us to uh, a fourth mini theory that we call basic psychological needs theory that was really about the essential ingredients in human wellness and thriving. And a spin-off from basic psychological need theory had to do with people's life goals. Some life goals were more satisfying of basic psychological needs than others. And so we came up with a theory of what we call intrinsic and extrinsic aspirations. Uh, and has a really great chapter on that in our recent handbook, uh, kind of summarizing the work in that field. And then the most recent mini theory is called relationships motivation theory, which really takes a lot of the ingredients from our other mini theories, but looks at them in the context of close relationships and what makes those high quality or less high quality. And there's been a lot of spin off theories from SDT and uh, sometimes called companion theories uh, to be politically correct, but some of them are derived, some of them are companion, but they things like compassion theory, what Bob Ballarand uh, has done. And, uh, integrative emotion regulation work that uh, is, is going on now. Many other uh, specific theories that we've developed off of SDT. You saw me say that there's been a lot of work in SDT and it's been applied in a lot of different areas of life. So SDT, I think one of the things that I like the most about it is that it has practical value in the world and we look at a lot of different uh, applied areas. So my own, you know, as a, as a clinical psychologist, this is one that probably has less work in it than I would like, but it's one that's dearest to my heart, but really education, organizations, these are places where we easily apply uh, principles. So that said, that's kind of a broad picture of SDT, and I won't go into much more detail on that, but I'm just saying across all of those different areas of work, because the fundamental question is this, what is it that we need to flourish? What is it that we need to thrive? And when we think about flourishing, we think about being full functioning, having energy, being able to grow, feeling like you're making progress in the things that are important to you, and then having personal integrity and coherence, which you do, not being split up and compartmentalized or otherwise defending um, internally. And so not only the conditions that help that happen, but also what are the conditions that undermine. And we think uh, as an organismic theory, and this is Joseph and I were talking about this morning, as an organismic theory, we think it's built into the nature of human beings to flourish. That's it's part of our human nature to be inquisitive, to be assimilative, to be curious, to be wanting to uh, incorporate and internalize the social regulations around us, uh, really to become fully functioning. This is an attribute of humans across cultures and across ages. But flourishing doesn't happen automatically. It requires certain nutrients. And when we think of those nutrients, we think of them in terms of what we call basic psychological needs. Now, the term basic need really is something that's essential to wellness and integrity and uh, full functioning. And we have physical needs, clearly. We can't be fully functioning without nutrient, without uh, certain vitamins. Um, at the same time, we think there's basic psychological needs, our foundations and nutrients that we need in order for our psyche to have integrity, growth, and vitality. And thinking about what those essential ingredients are, the theory posits that there are at least three clearly essential basic psychological means the needs for autonomy, the needs for competence, the needs for relatedness. And the theory really argues, so at least a dual process theory, if not a tribe process theory, but dual process theory, meaning that uh, when you find uh, when you find support for relatedness, when you find support for autonomy and support for competence, then uh, you get this integration. But when you find frustration of these basic psychological needs, you see the opposite, you see defense, compartmentalization, you see the darker sides of human nature starting to reveal themselves. So that's kind of the most general, broad sweeping uh, view of the theory. And we look at it across various different levels. So a lot of the theory is looking at interpersonal supports for basic psychological needs, how parents, how teachers, how managers can support the basic psychological needs of the people uh, that they are motivating and taking care of. Or we also look at it at organizational levels, how educational institutions, how companies, how businesses could have policies or practices that are either undermining or supportive of people's basic psychological needs. At a societal level, this is a place that we've been doing a lot more research is how economic systems, how political systems can have an impact on people's basic psychological needs and constraints and the deprivations that they impose on people. 
And then finally, intrapersonally, there's a lot of work going on in SDT now about how we can support our own basic psychological needs, how we can find our own ways to a fulfilling life through issues like need crafting or uh, learning more about how to be agentic in the context of uh, environments. Fixing up. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. I apologize. So one of the things about SDT is it just keeps growing. It keeps, you know, kind of uh, amazing. I, I remember one time talking to Julian Roeder, who was the locus of control person, and he said, well, I don't know what happened in my life. I it was like I was walking through a forest and smoking my pipe because I used to smoke a pipe, and I throw a match behind me, and I find that the forest is burning, and it's a little bit of that kind of sense of SDT. Just as concrete prop to show that it keeps growing. So this is our latest handbook that just uh, came out this year that had the chapters from, from John Marshall and from and other people in it. And that's just so that you would know that I actually was working when I was away with IPPD. So that was a big project. Now, today I'm going to talk about meta-analyses. And the question is why meta-analyses and SDT, particularly why is SDT in such an area for people to be doing meta-analyses? And I think this graph kind of explains it. This is the growth of publications in the area of SDT as a Google Scholar. If you look at self-determination there, you see it's been 182,000 total publications on SDT and uh, 1.8 million citations. It says something about the growth and the magnitude of, of this theory's progress over the years. Uh, so realizing that there are a lot of meta-analysis coming out uh, in this group, um, partly we had to change gears uh, when Kobe came around from doing some of the experimental work that we we're doing and some of the projects that we we're doing here in Sydney. And we thought, well, what can we do given that we're going to be doing a lot of work remotely and uh, doing uh, uh, not being able to be together in a laboratory here? So one of the things we said is let's review the meta analyses that are out there. And so we wrote a paper, and actually, um, this is my son, Will, he teaches at the University of Toronto. Originally, it was he and I who thought, oh, let's write a narrative review. The meta analysis that we find out there, and that's fine. But then when I had a meeting with our research group here, and the first comment from Stefano and Pete Medical is, well, you can't do a narrative review without tabling all of the effect sizes. And if you're going to table the effect sizes, we need to convert all those effect sizes. And then uh, Emma and Jasper said, yeah, but if you're going to do that, then you got to do a proper search. You need to do a full search of the literature. So we ended up doing a lot more work than I intended. I <laughs> and then we came out with this, which was published in St. Bulletin, which is a review of the recent meta analysis that had been done in SDT. And we know now that there are about 74 analysis, meta analyses that have been uh, published or out there in the field. But we review in this article 60 of them because that fit within the constraints of our search dates. Uh, the other things that constrain you when you do a systematic review. <laughs> So I just admire you like that. Thank you. And in doing so, we kind of looked at first of what are the meta analyses and what meta theories are they addressing within SCT? And uh, this is a table of some of these. So you can see that the most meta analyses have been done on our first two our first two big meta uh, mini theories, which is cognitive evaluation theory, uh, issues around the CET, and then organistic integration theory, which is the theory of internalization and relative autonomy. Um, and then basic psychological need theory is, is getting more attention, and I'll show some of the rubrics that are coming out on that now. Much less uh, meta-analyzed that they cause value orientation theory, which is only two meta-analyses, and they're really pretty restrictive meta-analyses in that area. And then in uh, global contents theory, uh, there are two meta-analyses, one particular the joy. <laughs> um, and then when we look at applied areas, there's been meta-analyses about uh, SDT in these different applied areas and just grab some of the different areas where meta analysis has been uh, accomplishing that. So today I'm not going to talk about all of these meta analyses. I just want to talk about some of the ones that came out of our research group over the past couple of years. Um, and I'm going to begin with meta analyses on this particular very um, central principle of SDT, which is that all motivation can be looked at along a continuum of its relative autonomy. And in particular, we have a taxonomy of motivation that says that there are uh, things that are highly autonomously motivated, like intrinsic motivation or identification. These are places where you're willingly engaged in what you're doing, and intrinsic motivation is fun, it's interesting, uh, and, and identification because you value the activity. But there are other forms of motivation that are more controlling, like interjection, external motivation, a motivation. And the further you go up on this continuum of autonomy, which you posit as a continuum, the more positive psychological behavioral outcomes that occur. 
to be briefly again, uh, our motivational continuum has these different uh, way stations on it. And uh, down at the bottom is a motivation. This is uh, me this morning thinking about doing a talk. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to. Uh, but this is when you do something where you don't really value the activity or you don't feel confident with the activity, and these are the reasons that you are walking at getting engaged with it. External regulation is a pretty controlled form of regulation. That's when you're doing something because you're pressured by external rewards and contingencies, or punishments, or sanctions, um, uh, because someone's pressuring you or forcing you to do it. So there's an external agent that's acting on you that's the impetus behind the motivation. Even when it's positive, it can be negative. So even when somebody's doing it through rewards, it's still in field control. And still a bit more autonomous is what we call interjection. And this is now where it's not other people who are pressuring you or forcing you to do something, but you yourself are doing it. So for instance, in relation to a talk, I, I don't like giving talks. I have no intrinsic motivation for it, but I have a high degree of interjection, which is that I feel really bad for every one of them. Uh, because I've done a poor job. So very self-critical, very, but it's also a driving force to be a pressure uh, to do things. So interjection is control. It's a little more autonomous than this, but it's less autonomous than this next way station, which is identification. And now you're doing something, not because it's fun or it's interesting, but because you know the value of it. Truthfully, uh, despite being a glossophobic, the reason I give any talks in the world is because it's partly for this reason. It's because I think it's important to communicate SDT. So, it's a driving force behind why one does that. And then intrinsic motivation is a hypothetical construct where you engage in something because it has uh, inherent interest for you, you find the challenges uh, fun, whatever. And it doesn't apply to the issue of talking, uh, <laughs> it could apply to things like sporting games and, uh, and for some people, public speaking. So there's been a lot of evidence. Uh, I'm studying the continuum. This is an old piece of evidence uh, from a meta analysis that was done by. Josh Howard, who's at Monash University, Marilyn Gagne in Montreal and Europe. Europe. And um, this is just one of the small pieces from their meta-analysis of the continuum, but they did uh, multi-dimensional uh, scaling of the different points along the continuum as measured by the typical SDT instruments. And you can see here that it forms a really nice one-dimensional MES, it forms a really nice continuum, but in terms of taking motivation. And this holds up across employees, across students, and across general samples. Now, just this is not a meta analysis, but it's one of the projects we've been working on. We're almost done with this manuscript. It's about to go out. It's led by Stephanie Dumetal. And what he wanted to do is look at the, uh, the um, continuum of autonomy in respect to all measures of motivation. This was a huge project. We collected all the measures of motivation you could find in the field of education. Added up to uh, 100 questionnaires, 175 sales, and 1,343 items measuring motivation in some way or another. So, what we did is we uh, took those items, we looked at the intercorrelations of them, we got rid of redundant items, we did a number of things to get rid of items that had bad psychometric uh, uh, properties, and then we took the remaining items from that and we subjected them to uh, what's called a bass Ackwards analysis. That means that this first step here is you take all of those items are subject them to a principal components uh, factor analysis and then principal components analysis. And then after you do that, you do a you force a two factor solution, you force a three factor solution, you factor force a four factor solution. You keep going until the, the model breaks apart. And uh, in this case, we got seven super factors at the bottom of our, of our first run at, uh, at the meta analysis. And then we did a bass backwards analysis on each of these super factors to see if we could call any further facets out of this. And it turns out that we got 26 different facets of motivation that were derived from all of the questionnaires that we find in the field of education. Now, why am I showing you all this versus show the diversity of kind of measures that are out there? But what we did was also place our continuum within this multi-dimensional scaling. What you can see here is that the MDS of all of these things is really looks like two dimensions, but one of the dimensions is clearly the dimension of relative autonomy. And you can see at the bottom here where our anchor, where our A motivation, where our external regulation, negative interjection, positive interjection, uh, identification, and increased motivation fit in this continuum. And this suggests that all types of motivation, even the ones that aren't specified by SAT, for instance, if we look at something like looking smart as motivation, you can see that it falls somewhere in the interjection. Range. So you can see that everything has some degree of relative autonomy, and that's what the purpose of this fast is to show. And 
we just about to send that out for review. So anyone's got a suggestion for a journal on this kind of paper, we're open to hearing. But anyway, um, one of the central propositions of organismic integration theory is that as you move up again, continue to get more positive outcomes. And so I'm going to begin with a meta-analysis looking at that. This is a meta-analysis that uh, I got to do with, with Josh Howard again uh, from uh, Monash and Julia Garo and Fred Gay um, and uh, Chong. Uh, so this was uh, a big meta-analysis. It had 344 samples and it over 200,000 participants in these samples, and we focus on the education domain. And it's a large paper. There are 26 different outcomes that are analyzed in this meta-analysis, but I'm going to just summarize them for you in some different ways here. In, in some of the analyses, we did a summary analysis by putting together what we call the adaptive outcomes. You see here that that includes your academic performance, engagement, efficacy, having a mastery approach, having more vitality and energy and positive affect. The maladaptive outcomes, which is dropout retention, absenteeism, and anxiety, and depression, boredom. And when you look at this, you can see that that continuum model works out really well in terms of its predictive value. So when, uh, when you look at uh, A motivation, it's poorly uh, associated with adaptive outcomes, but more strongly associated with maladaptive outcomes in this pattern uh, goes opposite of both, both types of outcomes. So this really, I think, is strong support for the SDT assumption. And, like integration theory of relative autonomy it really makes a difference in terms of these kinds of outcomes. Now, uh, so and then uh, if you look at some people would care a lot about performance outcomes. Uh, this is GPA. You see that uh, continues predictive of GPA. It's uh, whether you get self-reported GPA or objective uh, of GPA will show any your relationship. And the thing that's more important for SDT because truthfully, I don't think I think we care that much about achievement. I don't think we care that much about GPA, but we care a lot about kids' well-being and their flourishing. So this one's more important to me than any of them. This has to do with well-being. If you look at outcomes associated with well-being, uh, you can see that positive uh, level vitality, social emotional function, satisfaction, enjoyment, they go up as you go up in autonomy. And anxiety, depression, and that thing go down. So pretty, I think, convincing evidence in support of, uh, of the SDT principles and OIT uh, from this Howard meta-analysis. And this is just repeating the things that I just said. So, again, more timeless motivations uh, that are out. Now, this is not a meta-analysis we did in this lab, but it happened to be a parallel meta-analysis that was going on at the same time on the long book uh, with the uh, person who led this for Josh Howard is on it, so you can almost see Josh's influence here. This is basically the same graph of desirable and undesirable hip outcomes in the workplace. You can see the same pattern. Uh, the difference being is that the turnover is more toward the external end, switching point uh, in organizations where it's more rapid interjection in the education level, but otherwise find these very similar. Terms of motivation turns out to be the most important type of employee for employee, predicting employee attitudes uh, and behavior and well being. But if you want to predict performance and organizational citizenship, sort of more effortful parts of the organization, then it's adaptation that's the best predictor. And as we always predict with interjection, it has both positive and negative correlates. Uh, it sometimes predicts maybe more work effort, but it also will predict less well being and more tension and stress at work. The way in which you're motivating yourself. And external regulation is easily not predicted, even though in organizations this tends to be the most emphasized uh, form of motivating others. It's maybe one of the least effective. So I'm not going to review this one. This is Diego's meta analysis that he led here, but I just want to say it was, went out around the same time around the 2020s when it was finally published. And uh, Diego, luckily for me, because otherwise we'd have a hard time in this building, I think, uh, <laughs> was able to show uh, that the continuum was uh, functioning as we expected. So this is in the context of physical education classes, uh, autonomous motivation committee. Uh, so and uh, part of that meta-analysis is, is one of the first comprehensive meta-analysis to really look at teacher supports and their, especially teacher supports for autonomy, competence, and relatedness as they're predicted by the main. Uh, each uh, were uh, well correlated with their respective need satisfactions, as you can see here. So, 
this principle in SDT, principle that relative autonomy makes a difference, I think it's been well sustained in these meta analyses, uh, autonomous motivation leading to better performance, uh, sustained engagement, and better attitudes and behaviors. Now, one of the things I want to say is I didn't talk about this much, but we always looked in our, our meta analysis and Josh's meta analysis and uh, on, the, on your look at this in Hertz is for moderate, particularly moderation by culture, moderation by age, moderation by context. And largely, we don't expect these moderators uh, to have much weight in these analyses. In fact, here in this meta analysis, they don't. That meta analysis of Josh holds up at every level of educational uh, team. So kind of the next place I want to go is that uh, we argue in across CBT, OIT, and uh, basic psychological need theory that when you thwart people's basic psychological needs, it tends to move their uh, relative autonomy down, but when you support their basic psychological needs, it tends to move their uh, relative autonomy up in the domain of activity. And then, so the first place I want to look at that in these meta-analysis is the domain of autonomy. Now, First thing I want to point out is this is my daughter and my granddaughter. So um, this is another reason why I'm staying in the United States longer than I'd like to. So I'm always this a lot. She's now almost three years old. But you know, I think parenting, I think a lot of people in here know, is the world's most important and maybe one of the world's most difficult jobs. It takes demanding, it takes a lot of resources to do. It's pretty applicable. Mm -hmm. And SETs had a tradition of focus on parents. They're uh, supporting basic psychological needs through three dimensions. One is directly through supporting autonomy. The second is by providing a home life and an atmosphere that's highly structured so that children know what's expected of them and they know how to um, uh, move forward in their various agendas of life. So, structure uh, supports um, competence and then positive involvement, being warm, paying attention, spending time with dedicated resources to children. Uh, can, if it's positive and not controlling, uh, influence uh, relatedness uh, satisfaction. So these three sources of support are really important, but mostly uh, we study autonomy support uh, as the main ingredient in parenting. Uh, and uh, as I said before, this is my Australian daughter and friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very important. I'm sorry, I haven't seen that. <laughs> Uh, but when you're supporting uh, your child's autonomy, it means that almost in every interaction, you should begin that interaction, you're considerate of what the child's point of view is. You're not always agreeing with them, but you understand and take consideration of what's going on uh, for them experientially. Meryl uh, Meg recently wrote a paper on the consideration as the core element of autonomy support and an attachment that I really like a lot. You're also Care about your child's ideas and their inputs, and you're trying to foster a sense of ownership over the activities they engage in and the agency. You're minimizing the use of controlling rewards and controlling language, shoulds, have tos, busts, and uh, do this or else. All uh, those things are not helpful in promoting motivation. And when you're going to ask your child to do something that uh, maybe they don't find fun or they don't understand, you're providing a rationale that they can appreciate. And if you don't have a rationale, you should question why you're asking them to do it. And if they're not old enough to understand any rationale at all, then I think you can be compassionate and empathic with the resistance that they put up. Like that, all through um, interactions, you're always having resistance and struggles, and not supposed to see what's about. So that's just some basic elements of autonomy support. I really just put this up so I can get you. One of the reasons we study autonomy support so intently, though, is we think that when you're supporting autonomy, when you're really taking the perspective of your child, when you're listening, when you're deeply listening, you're supporting all three basic psychological needs. This is true both as manager, this is teachers, also as parents. Is that uh, the tendency toward our time is for leads you to be aware of the obstacles and struggles that your charge is facing and then helps you deal with that. So it really ends up being supportive of all three basic psychological needs. And controlling behavior tends to actually frustrate all three basic psychological needs. It's control not only frustrates autonomy, it often, often conveys incompetence, and it also often conveys a lack of connection with the person who you control. So we uh, have recently accomplished a meta-analysis that was still underway uh, here at uh, IPBE, but this was the first round that we did on that, where uh, we were looking for all of the uh, reports that we could find where autonomy support was uh, 
uh, of a parent who's combined with outcomes uh, for uh, for um, children. And this is the kind of overall results from that from that meta analysis as, as it currently stands. And you know, in the next slide, it's easier to see. So we can see that autonomy supportive parenting is negatively associated with children's ill being, and controlling parenting is positively supportive with uh, children's ill being. And although the line is not here, autonomy supportive parenting is positive with uh, child well being across, so the line is going to be less significant. Now, what's interesting about this, this may not sound like news to people who know SDT, but one thing that is real news here is that although all along we've been able to show evidence of autonomy support predicting more positive outcomes, this meta analysis shows that controlling parent behavior across countries, across ages, across uh, all the contexts in which we look for moderators is negatively associated with well being and positively associated with well being. So it's not just that we prescribe autonomy support, we're also proscribed. So, um, and then, uh, you know, so we, these are all completely, we see that it's like across region, across child age, across gender, across who's reporting, uh, uh, publication types, et cetera. So these are just ways to see if you can uh, look for moderators, but the effect is there across all of this. So I'm now doing a, um, involved in a group that's doing a better analysis. That's probably the largest meta analysis I've ever involved in. It's uh, being, uh, uh, led by Gavin Schlepp, who's at the uh, University of Melbourne, who down in next week, uh, hopefully we'll finish up this particular manuscript, which is now on its third round of review at JPSP. So it's been through a lot, but uh, it's improving each time. Sometimes reviews are actually helpful. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the reasons for this meta analysis is if you look at the history of, uh, of uh, primary studies on autonomy support uh, across organizations across parenting, across coaching, et cetera, you see that there's a lot of these studies and they're growing, but there's many fewer studies on competence support and on relatedness support uh, in the literature. So we wanted to look at whether these things make a difference above and beyond autonomy support is one of our fundamental questions and uh, for what they say would make a difference. Now uh, there's Gavin uh, right there to catch up a little bit. So we asked him to what extent do the three, three supportive intercursive behaviors predict basic psychological needs and then uh, positive outcomes? Uh, and do they vary this function of culture again or the applied domain with the source of the support, whether it's parents or bosses, et cetera? And then, whether, especially whether confidence and related supports are adding in any incremental variance above and beyond autonomy support, which has been the classic thing to study. And then we do one other thing here is now we look at what we call vertical. Interpersonal supports where it's teacher and child, parent, child, uh, boss, employee, but also vertical, I mean, horizontal supports, uh, teammates, classmates, siblings, all of these things are considered in this bad analysis horizontal supports. We can also support or undermine the sense of autonomy and companies and relatedness. So we screened a lot, a lot of studies for this. It's a, it's a huge uh, meta analysis in a way because we're going through all of those. And so, at the, at the current time, although we're probably going to be expanding this over the last review, we have 890 studies including this meta analysis. A lot more effects on it. So, I'm just going to show you some of the main effects here. So, this is basically the motivation. We see that uh, when positive support and related support are measured, they are predicting uh, positive outcomes as we expect. Uh, autonomy support, of course, following the, the typical pattern. Uh, that it does. So you can see autonomy supports what you need, autonomous forms of motivation, uh, and uh, not so much the goal forms of motivation. Same is true for these other supports. And <clears throat> when we look at well being performance outcomes, not just motivation well, and uh, need outcomes, we see again that all three types of support have some predictive value for a lot. But then we went looking for moderators. And an important question for SDT is for the cultural moderator. A lot of people in cast, uh, although it's getting left and less uh, claimed, but it used to be a common claim that this wouldn't apply in uh, collectivistic countries or in other kind of cultures that were not individualistic. So we looked for moderation by cultures in these patterns, also by vertical and horizontal supports, domain of activity, whether there are any differences in our analysis of the strength of these relationships, function of the domain. 
then which measures were showing the biggest effects? Now, just out of the slash thing, the biggest, yeah, the biggest effects come from all the climate measures where we're getting a kind of holistic view of the needs supporting these in the climate. They tend to be strong. When you go to specific operations, uh, things like structure or involvement, you see we you see positive about the effects. Uh, one moderator that uh, was there was the cultural moderator. So, you know, you used to expect no moderation by culture, but there was moderation by culture, but it's opposite of what most people would predict of time is a bigger difference, the less influence it uh, It's not a strong effect, but this, and that, this is that very important. We've seen in most of the analysis that we've done with the individual studies, but it's not being So, it's a bigger difference. It's kind of in a collective and then there was another moderator that was not an expected one, but was age. And what this shows is that autonomy support makes a bigger difference on outcomes the younger you are. So, of course, I guess that makes some development sense. Hopefully, we develop our own resilience and capacities over time. So, we're less affected by the supports or lack thereof in the environment. But it's not a strong, strong effect. But still, uh, autonomy support has an age moderated for autonomous motivation and also for the outcome of competence satisfaction. No other places. Now, I just want to turn now to uh, one way of explaining this next thing, which is, has to do with um, whether adding the other kinds of supports on top of autonomy support makes a difference. And so, on this first one here, you see our class model that most of the speeding tests of autonomy support is predictive of all three basic psychological needs. It's been our long claim. But if you add in studies where they measure competence support, you can see that the variance in all three outcomes goes up just a bit. Uh, so that uh, uh, actually there's a square that's shooting down the bottom, but it's not there, but it shows that there's a bit more variance accounted for uh, in each of these outcomes when you add competence support. The same is true when you add relatedness support, so you get a bit of increment in uh, variance accounted for. And when you account for all three sources of support, now here you have a significant difference in the R squares is, uh, is significant in all cases. So an implication of this is that although we traditionally only measure autonomy support because we think it's kind of covering all three needs, it would be beneficial to us in studies to make sure we measure all three sources of support because they, they, they all matter. Is that what you think? Or is that what you think? Now, this is the, when we look at the issue of the lateral versus uh, horizontal, uh, well, they call lateral, I call horizontal, vertical. I think we're going to call them horizontal paper. But you see that vertical autonomy supports, as we'd expect, are predictive of these satisfactions as our lateral ones. And uh, when you start to put them together here, vertical and lateral, you can see that uh, it's incremental variance over just vertical alone. So the lateral autonomy support makes a difference. And it's true for confidence and relatedness. So always adding that lateral that lateral source of support, whether it's for autonomy, confidence or relatedness, makes a difference to outcomes. So this is another area where we typically have only studied vertical supports. We rarely look at siblings, we rarely look at teammates, classmates, all of those some studies that do do that. Uh, but this meta-analysis suggests we should do more of that. And they're more important than I would have thought from this analysis. But please, please, I've already said one of the things that was when you look at a big meta analysis like that with uh, hundreds of studies that we have in it, uh, I guess this is one of the things about meta analysis in general, which is that you see uh, one of the weaknesses is that there's a lot of measurement differences. Uh, and we looked to see which measures uh, made the most difference, but we found 59 distinct measures for autonomy support, which tells us something about the variation of the relationship we're looking at. 29 to 35 respectively for these kinds of support. So I think we could do some consolidation in the measurement sphere around this. And 73% of the studies were cross-section. Um, that's a lot of cross-section studies. So I think an increasing number of involved two well and experimental studies really Now another area that um, STT has been involved in is uh, the exploration of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is really Aristotelian tradition about living a good life, full life. Uh, and uh, Aristotle made an empirical claim, uh, and I've talked on this before at this institute, that when we live a life where we're engaged in virtuous exercise of our human potentialities, 
that's going to be a good life. So he wasn't a hedonist. He wasn't all about go after the pleasure. He was saying live a good, virtuous life where you employ the excellences and talents that you have. And uh, related to our work, it means that when you pursue personal growth, when you pursue the things that are worthy, good, uh, that, that will deeply satisfy your basic psychological needs. Whereas doing things that are not virtuous should be not helpful to your basic psychological needs if the Aristotelian claim is true. And when we first started on this, I did a lot of this early work with Tim Kasser, uh, where we started to look at people's life goals. Like, what are you after in life? And some people are after financial success and fame and uh, having a great image. Uh, these are things that are really important to me personally. Uh, <laughs> these are things that a lot of people are chasing in life. They uh, imagine that those are the things that will make them happy. But uh, people are chasing things like meaningful relationships or living in a community or Aging health related behaviors. So we, we called these intrinsic life goals because we thought these would be the ones that would be most satisfying the basic psychological needs and fulfill the Aristotelian prediction that uh, that you would have a better life if these are the things that you're after. And the opposite is true of extrinsic life goals. And lots and lots of studies were done on this. Uh, and I know about 35 international samples that were done uh, testing the uh, intrinsic versus extrinsic. Uh, dimension of its predictions outcomes. Uh, we've seen it in a lot of different age groups and occupations. So you can see that this many study begged for a meta analysis to, uh, to summarize that data. And that was performed by Bradshaw, company here at IBDE. Uh, and in this meta analysis, we're just looking at the full length of intrinsic versus extrinsic value. We need to see here that uh, on average, having more intrinsic aspirations is positively associated with wealth. Driving outcomes uh, at the point of no moderation by country and no moderation by socioeconomic status. So a lot of people would say, well, that's just because you, you know it's an SES thing, but this is true across the socioeconomic spectrum. Now, another meta-analysis that we're currently engaged in now, and I think this is now under the third or fourth round at site bulletin, is a process that's being led by Kelly. And uh, what Kelly's looking at is the characteristics of parents that would influence the, in, the intrinsic versus aspirations of their kids. And uh, in the, uh, the current submission, we have 47 studies that are in there, uh, but they're asking us to do an even wider search. So that's why I'm calling this preliminary results. But what the results we found from the first 47 studies is that uh, when parents uh, act in a way that's conducive to the need satisfaction of their children, their children are more likely to aspire intrinsically. And when parents themselves embrace intrinsic aspirations, their children are more likely to embrace intrinsic aspirations. But when parents are after extrinsic aspirations, that will have an irradiation effect for their children. And parenting is being frustrating is also associated with um, extrinsic values. So we're hoping that those results hold up. Mm -hmm. the next thousand screenings that we have in the review at site book. But, uh, I have to admit here in front of an audience, I said, Kelly, don't send that to St. Paul, they'll never take it. I was told it wrong. And so my good writing can do. So um, now just uh, related to this whole idea about pursuing uh, excellences and virtues, we've for a long time been interested in how being good, being benevolent, being kind, being empathic with other people could benefit your wellness through the satisfaction of basic psychological needs. And so uh, early on with Netta Weinstein, for instance, uh, we did a bunch of studies showing that when you voluntarily or autonomously help other people, not only did their well-being go up, but your own well-being goes up because it satisfies your basic psychological needs. When you help other people willingly, you're getting uh, the autonomy need, you're feeling more connected with others, and you're feeling effective because you're helping other people. So it's all three things. Frank Martella, who came to a study at Rochester for Couple of years, he was a philosophy major who kind of re-specialized in psychology, and not in the full-blown research psychologist in Finland. Uh, we started to study uh, this issue, and we found that pro-social behavior does increase well-being and vitality uh, through basic psychological needs. And it doesn't even matter whether you see the beneficiary; you don't have to get any indirect benefit from people smiling at you or welcoming it. It's the very act of giving itself that is the satisfying piece. Uh, and so we show how benevolence enhances well-being. Uh, and kind of interesting in this research is that uh, benevolence is mostly, the effects of benevolence are mostly explained by the three basic psychological needs satisfaction, but there's a little bit of variance left over that we call the warm glow of benevolence, which also uh, 
sense of well-being, and uh, that sense of meaning in life is really contributed by all basic psychological needs and issues. So these are this Frank's work, and that is work, other people's work is really uh, allowing us to have some hypotheses that helping and benevolence uh, really enhance well-being through basic psychological needs. Now, on the opposite side, we've been looking at when you do harm to other people, that should frustrate your basic psychological needs, or at least not fulfill those basic psychological needs, and so therefore be harmful to well-being. And mainly on this, uh, Nikki Brigade has been the main person who's been doing this chain of research to people that have started research out there. But one of the cool studies that uh, Nikki and I got to do with uh, Cody and Dehan when I was still at Rochester, we did experiments where we put people in a position to exclude other people in a uh, uh, electronic game called the cyberball game. So it's a very minor social injury to other people by excluding them from the game, not throwing the ball to them. Now, there was no person on the other end of that cyberball, so nobody was actually being hurt, but people believed that they were excluding them. So it was a little bit like a mild form of this game. You know the experiments from the 50s. What we found is that when we put people in a position to uh, exclude others, they suffered as much distress as does an excluded person. So there's evidence on how much it feels to be excluded in the cyberball game. It's just as distressing to exclude the other. And in particular, it frustrates needs for autonomy and relatedness that we use that distress. We did other experiments where after people excluded somebody else, we gave half the people a chance to repair that because they could play again with that same person. And we found that they overthrew to the person that they previously ostracized, showing that propensity of people to try and make up this harm that they've done, that autonomously they would like to do well by other people. And then even when you remember instances of ostracism in life that you felt were justified, where it was good to exclude the other person, you still feel bad and distress about it through the frustration of basic psychological needs. So some summary points is that you know we think human nature is about basically to be good under nurturing and supportive conditions that we want to abolish and we do want to help others. And one of the reasons that we do that is because it's actually satisfying and it's into our well-being. And harming does the opposite of that. And so from that, we reason that under conditions of autonomy support, when you have autonomous motivation, you're going to be more likely to be pro-social. And then when you're under conditions of being controlled or have controlled motivations, or when you do something antisocial, you're more likely to have controlled motivations for it. So what to do about that? Meta-analysis, that's the answer. <laughs> so we did a meta-analysis, and this was led by James Donald, who's here in the room, so James can lose quite in this now. <laughs> in this meta-analysis, we searched out all the papers that we could, uh, where we were looking at either autonomy support or autonomy or control and uh, control the uh, regulate, external regulation, and looking at whether that predicted uh, antisocial or pro-social outcomes. That we had 138 studies that entered into that analysis. This is the overall model. The overall model suggests that control is positively associated with antisocial behavior. Autonomy is associated with more pro-social behavior. Now, we, we know there's a lot of moderating and conditional effects on these outcomes, but the, the pattern is generally there. Just to look at that a little bit differently, you can do the forest plot of, um, say, autonomy and pro-sociality. You see most of the studies do show that uh, relation pretty well, although there's a few outliers on that. Uh, and the worst plot of the race between uh, autonomy and antisociality. It's weaker, but still largely negative. Um, and when you look at the control and antisociality, you see a uh, stronger effect on the positive side, and then it's probably the least reliable effect of the relationship between control and pro sociality. So sometimes people do act in pro social ways because they've been made to pressure to do so, but it's more the exception. So it seems that when people have autonomy, they're more likely to be pro-social. Uh, autonomous pro-social acts are very need satisfying, which is why they enhance our wellness. Uh, harmful acts are typically not autonomous. In fact, you know, a lot of our interviews with people, when they do negative things or anti-social things, they always say, well, somebody made me do it, or I had to do it. They don't say, oh, I wanted to do that. I wanted to hurt James. Uh, that's my intention. That's, that's almost never said. So the attribution of why we do a lot of things is are damaged itself. Uh, and of course, how you decrease offenses and social behaviors. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important for things like this. So this is a, a study that uh, that you know, comes out of the community here and John, John Marshall, I mean, and heard that this is American psychologist, but 
you know, in this study, they are showing that when you do new interventions in schools and teachers become more autonomous, or if you get less bullying, less victimization in that school, so you're creating more autonomy, supportive atmosphere, and violence and bullying is going down. Not just their study, but other studies have shown the same thing. We see the same thing in workplaces. We have more autonomy, supportive management, we have less antisocial behavior, work less counterproductive work behavior. Uh, so we see a lot of these outcomes coming from the climate that's set. So I'm trying to support work control. So I'm going to end on, on this note on mindfulness, which is an area that has always been interesting to me because for a long time, uh, really ever since Kurt Brown came to Rochester and started to study this together, we've argued that mindfulness, being aware of what's going on in the moment, being receptive to what's occurring, uh, helps you uh, Self-regulation helps you be more aware of what's going on, helps you make better choices for what you're going to do, and helps you make choices that you're going to be standing behind. So it's conducive to human autonomy. Uh, and you know, we've shown this in lots of different ways. It's a daily diary study that we did a long time ago, and I just use it because it's illustrative. In moments or on days when you're more mindful, you have more autonomy, and that you have higher trade mindfulness, you have more, yeah, more autonomy. So both the state and trade. Uh, mindfulness are affecting day to day autonomy estimates. So we know that it's pretty important for them. And in our meta analysis, we looked at the continual motivation and how it's associated with mindfulness. And what you can see here is that the same continual we've been looking at all along, and the association with mindfulness, you see a motivation is negatively correlated with mindfulness, external regulation negatively, interjected negatively. Now we're in the autonomous range, you know, all three forms of autonomous motivation. Positively associated with mindfulness. That's actually pretty reasonable. We had 89 studies in this. I think that's because James didn't do really a thorough search. <laughs> <laughs> There's only a PSB piece of thought. That's right. <laughs> and this is just a different way of displaying the same thing as the effects of uh, each type of motivation in this relationship with mindfulness. Same thing with general health. So we wrote a review paper based on this that. Uh, yeah, that we came out in the uh, current directions. And really just making a theoretical argument for this, which is that mindfulness supplies a ground uh, that's conducive to more autonomous uh, self regulation, and then that's associated with greater well being. So, a lot of people have said about mindfulness predicts well being, but the question is how? In what way does mindfulness create well being? Is it just because it relaxes you? Is it because it makes you calmer? But we think those things might be true, but the, maybe one of the biggest sources of that. Increasing wellness by improving yourself and being So, you know, most of the things I've talked about so far are kind of summaries of the field. It's confirming uh, what's going on there. One of the weaknesses of that analysis is it always seems like it's kind of come lately. It's like we already discovered all this stuff and now we're just confirming it, which is a little less satisfying sometimes to get new finding out about. I just wanted to show you that we're not just doing meta analysis here. <laughs> <laughs> We have a few studies that are going now. We're doing a lot of work on motivation and financial uh, regulation, whether people are paying attention to their finances, spending their bills, and why. Uh, we're looking at the contents of memories and solitude, whether you're thinking about intrinsic protections of past events and how they're affecting the quality of time alone. Uh, we're doing a study around this group here. It's a George and Kelly. And, uh, Looking at the role of basic needs, satisfaction on indigenous and non indigenous Australians, because we asked them an open ended essay about what was your what's the time in your life when you were thriving the most? And then the frameworks for the need satisfactions that are occurring, and we also have uh, questions that follow up on some the way. One of the areas that we've been strongly looking at, we have some publications and some new ones that talk about are on social capabilities. How does poverty, how does access to uh, education, how does access to housing, how do those things have an impact on people's basic psychological needs and therefore their wellness? So we have a few studies on these, what we call social determinants of health, the conditions of living, the impact that's having on wellness. And associated with that is uh, we've been looking at the capabilities literature, two of the biggest variables in there are freedom from discrimination and freedom of expression. And we're looking at that across uh, groups that have been traditionally discriminated against and the impact that, that has on their wellness. Uh, Frank Martell and I have been trying to push measures of basic psychological needs into national assessments of wellness, and we've come up with a three item measure, one item for each need that works almost as well as full scale items. And now uh, we have that under review now so that we can get this in the like, social science survey and others. Looks like we might have some success in that. 
Another thing that we've been working on is uh, with Raphael Calvo, who some of you know, who used to be at Sydney and now he's at uh, uh, Imperial College London. Uh, we're working on uh, motivation uh, for user experience and technology and how technology be able to satisfy our question, whatever it is, psychological needs. A few other projects that we're working on. Um, <laughs> not a small group is we're doing a bunch of these bass backwards projects that we've fallen on the bass backwards methodology. I showed you one of them, but one of the ones we've done now is we've taken all the different managerial style constructs that are out there, uh, things like uh, transformational leadership, servant leadership, um, transactional leadership, all the different leadership styles that are out there. And in the same way, all of us, I just subjected them to the fast factors and we've come out with a kind of really interesting solution on that. Uh, one of the things that we're doing that also uses fast actors is we're developing a big five assessment of basic psychological needs. We're using adjective checklists and we're getting our fastest from the fast actors. Uh, we've worked on job demands and resources with the Signet Insurance Company. Uh, so we've been able to access some big samples from them because of uh, collaborating with them on my work. And what else? It's all other stuff. We've done a lot of work on COVID. Uh, Compliance and management and messaging, how governments message and what impact that has. Uh, especially in Belgium, where they were able to collect over 500,000 respondents across uh, like 70 different data collections, where we can look at the rise and fall of compliance as a function of government messaging that's either controlling or informative and autonomous. And finally, um, I believe it's obvious that will kill me if I left it. <laughs> we're studying why people buy Bitcoin. Bitcoin. He's very much a Bitcoin fan, and we're working with a company called ShapePay, which is a place where people invest their Bitcoin or trade their Bitcoin. Um, we're surveying them. And it's, it's, that's some of the stuff we do in the IPP just to show that we're not just doing that analysis, we're also trying to push the boundaries of the SDT. But we can, and this is the more fun stuff. But this is the uh, last, this is the picture of the last South Foundation conference, which happened this June in Orlando, Florida. We had about uh, eight, um, we had about 700 people who attended uh, the conference. It was a really good conference. James was there. Can't find me. Yes, was there. So it was a good conference. Uh, we shared a lot of ideas. So we haven't been doing. I haven't been doing nothing since I was exiled from, uh, <laughs> from, from my PPE. I'm glad to be back uh, to be pursuing this work. But I think you know the main conclusion I've come from this is that we've done a lot, a lot of work with the team. But it's nice to see some of you getting confirmed at a matter of level because it gives us a foundation out of which you work. So that's uh, that's pretty much. Mm -hmm. So I left no time for questions. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> to the your meta analysis the uh, meta analysis in um meta analysis the uh motivation continuum in the education and working place mm -hmm. so um if you see the graph that's that's a text graph yeah yeah. So what? Um, if I now this is Anya Barman, so I'll try and answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was on the yeah. I'll move you over to the You were just suggesting the eighty slides, by the way. <laughs> Right, yeah, right. that's the uh, walking through. Go on. Right. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Okay. First, yeah. First, yeah. Okay. First, yeah. 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 Like a Gagne survey for regulations, you see in there that some of it is, you know, I work for pay, and that's called external regulation. And that, that's really different than external regulation in the context of school, which tends to be more controlling. So, actually, if you look behind why people are working for pay, you find 
some different reasons for that, yeah, which shows sure. why um, it could end up with a kind of net small yeah. positive effect. Yeah. That. Well, That's why I thought it was really interesting to cross over in the education ones here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for the dance. And uh, the how we um, interpret that in a student context, inter interject regulation regulation is more like a neutral. Mm. In, uh, in, so in school, yeah. In yeah. Their, um, so learning. School, like, but probably students can interpret that. That doesn't mean yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's actually better than this code. So because at least you've internalized. Yeah. 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 And I think that that's better than not internalizing something. So, you know, we often bad not interjection. But I think interjection is actually not always a bad thing. It's good to sometimes have a should uh, that's within you. In fact, I just read an article that I really like, which is, uh, I'm hoping that it'll get into the journal, but they did a reanalysis of interjection items across the STT literature, and they find really four dimensions. So what they find is that at the low end of it is that when you are doing something to avoid shame or disapproval from others, that's the most controlling form of interjection. Next up is that when you feel ashamed or, or pressured by yourself. The third one is that uh, is. No, I'm sorry, when you yeah, feel shame and pressure for yourself. The third one is when you're trying to live up to the approval of others. And then the fourth one is when you're trying to live up to your own ideals. And that, that one, the fourth one, almost balances right into identification. So you can see that even within interjection, this kind of continuum was important. And this goes back when we originally invented it, our original simplex scale was seven stages long. We had the avoidance of punishment. The getting of reward, the avoidance of disapproval, the getting of approval, the avoidance of falling in an ideal, the getting to an ideal, and then intrinsic motivation, which has no avoidance form. So there were seven. The journals rejected it because every yeah, once in a while you get an anomalous correlation. So we just crunched them, and that was reliable, and that's how we got into the originalist. But now this is kind of returning it to the original idea, the more differentiated idea. Well, as well, because you've got positive and negative interjection plotted on there, you can see that the, the range of that is actually quite nasty. Quite nasty. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it feels that interjection is too big a category, yeah. and it really yeah. needs to be broken yeah. down into subcategories. On the small point, which about the collectivist versus individualistic societies in the meta analysis of Gavin, I thought that was quite interesting. Um, I mean, what, what's your thinking around that, around why effects would be larger in collectivist? Societies. You know, I don't. I don't have a strong hypothesis, yeah. but it's not. It's it's a it's an interaction that I've seen in a lot of other settings. For instance, if you go to colleges and you find students who are most anxious, most concerned, they benefit the most from autonomy support. If you're and, uh, so, it's almost like if you have less to begin with, then you benefit more when it's present. And yeah. it could be that uh, there are more controlled features in collective society, so autonomy support makes a big difference. Yeah, in there. Yeah, uh, I, I know we've. Also, it should be looking at vertical and horizontal societies because that's probably effectively bigger than the interest of the class. Well, we maybe have to look at that. We found that in the merit meta as well that uh, for every 10 point increase in the Hofstede measure of individualism versus collectivism, there was a 0.02 increase in the utility of vertical well, autonomy support well, as you become more collectivistic, yeah. such that by the top of the scale, you're about 20 points ahead um, in terms of the benefit of autonomy support in collectivistic cultures versus individualistic cultures. Seems to be uh, the primary one that's the focus, but uh, does that mean that the other needs are mediated through uh, autonomy support or the hierarchy, or is it really the three go together? So it's really a global component with a little left over for some of the bits on the side. I favor the last. All three go together. They're highly correlated. They actually satisfy each other in some ways. And one of the things that's interesting about this new Bass Hackman's approach we're taking to the agent protectors is we're hoping to identify kind of uh, in between needs. So one of the ones we were looking at yesterday when we were talking about it was uh, one of the factors that come out was like, looks like I have opportunities in life or I have places to go. We're hoping that that falls kind of both autonomy and confidence, like kind of in between them in network analysis. Uh, the high intercorrelation between the three needs is something I think no other theory would really predict. We always think that autonomy and relatedness and confidence are 
flow needed to correlate with one another at a general level. And you would think, well, these are very different word contents, but why do they operate together as they do? But it's kind of hard to feel confidence when you're doing something you don't want to do. Even if you do it well, you don't take it in rather white and make claim that you don't just look at it in strong confidence when you're doing what others want to get positive feedback for. It. You don't really feel related to unless other people are also considering your point of view and supporting your sense of self and volition in it. Um, and so we, we see this interdependence between basic psychological needs in their operation. So separating it's been really hard. That's why factor analytics stuff has been really hard, and that's why I want to work with Bobby <laughs> <laughs> Because, because there, there's a there's a theoretical reasons to believe the synergies that we have. Um, we sort of see evidence of that, but Model. Well, well, clearly, there's a difference in your parents and the different outcomes of belonging. It's got a sense of belonging. It's not surprising. It's very much fun. You're related to the lady. Yes. Um, so, I mean, in a sense, that supports it, but I guess the, uh, most, of the, most of the outcome variables are substantially related to the uh, autonomy. Yeah, part of that's because that's what we've studied a lot. You know, I, I do know when we were first starting the theory, um, there were really three of us who were involved in the study of Jim Connell and, and DC and me. And we each argued for a different fundamental reason. And so Jim Connell came from Susan Carter, she's a developmental psychologist in Denver, and he was one of her students. So for him, perceived competence was the biggest thing. If you didn't feel competence, you couldn't be motivated. Um, I was very much around uh, relationships and attachment. Psychology is just the foundation of everything. So it was really fundamental. And, uh, and I don't know that was how to be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so we would argue back and forth about which is most fundamental. We're finally settling on they're all fundamental. You can't have any fun fully functioning person without all three basic needs firing. So that's that's how we sound, but that's not a good enough answer because I think now we have sophisticated enough tools to know how they should relate to one another. I think that's worth exploring. With huge synthesizers that you've got, can you look at people that have discrepant scores in different components? So uh, somebody that's high and one and low autonomy. And some people have done that, and that's that's resulted like Ken Sheldon did some work to show that whenever needs get out of balance. Above and beyond the effect of the need satisfaction itself, a balance issue itself and predict incremental variance to it. So it suggests that when things get out of balance, uh, that's problematic. But balance isn't quite the thing. Yet. I mean, that, that's not a, that's not an explanation. It's just a description of mm -hmm. what those results are. So I can still. Yeah. Um, in the figures where you looked at the addition in the R square when you look at autonomy. Yeah. Just, I'm curious. Did you also look at just the relatedness support and just the confidence support and see how much elsewhere that had? Yeah, it's, I think it's in there. Isn't it? Was it in that graph? It's the gap in that analysis. So here. <laughs> so, yeah, like we don't have it in here. Yeah, but if you, if you look at autonomy, predicting autonomy, it doesn't predict as well as autonomy, confidence, and related to sports predicting autonomy. Also. The other questions that we're done? <laughs> Just to make a joke with the eumonic world meaning, where is in that, uh, is it in the extrinsic or intrinsic? <laughs> What's that? H, H, index. H index? I don't know. If it gets, if it, if it keeps my job, it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> you know, truthfully, all those, those things like uh, citations and H indexes, I, it's not so much about uh, an ego thing, it says something about the influence of the theory. It says that it's getting disseminated, that people are reading it, that, and um, just a couple of things that I want to say about that. We, I was just recently in Belgium, and all of the Flanders schools, all schools in Flanders now train SDT 
uh, all the way from K through university, all teachers in all schools are being trained in SDT now. And it shows something about the influence of, of SDT. And uh, that's a lot to do with people who've been pushing that. You know, John Marshall, I think of, of the work that you've done as being really key to that dissemination in schools around the world. I mean, we're now seeing at the Center for Self-Determination Theory, there's a consortium of schools that are entirely based on SDT. They're not typically not public schools, but are making that their core philosophy. And they're making a little study group uh, through uh, CSDT right now, and right, right so far there's been eight schools that just I have joined up for that. It's kind of cool to see uh, workplaces, schools, um, teams, coaches uh, employing these techniques because we just know that they're better for people. And you know, when I think of what's the goal of education, this is the chapter that John Marshall and I wrote in, in this book, uh, along with uh, <laughs> some, some other authors. We said the goal of education is student flourishing, it's not achievement. Student flourishing. Every student should come out of school a better person, a more curious person, a more active person, a more vital person. They will come out with different achievement levels, but that's not the goal of SDT. The SDT goal is, is thriving. That's what the interventions do. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Anybody want to look at the 